Sappho, the ancient Greek poet, was born around 630 BCE on the island of Lesbos, located in the northeastern Aegean Sea. Lesbos was a prosperous island with a thriving culture, and Sappho's hometown of Mytilene was one of its most important cities. Mytilene was the chief city of the island of Lesbos during Sappho's time, and it was a prosperous and influential city-state. Mytilene was known for its culture, commerce, and political power, and it played an important role in the affairs of ancient Greece. The city had a thriving port, which made it a center for trade and commerce. Mytilene was also famous for its wine, which was exported throughout the Mediterranean world. The city was home to a number of important public buildings, including a theater, a gymnasium, and a large temple dedicated to the goddess Hera. Mytilene was ruled by an oligarchy, a small group of wealthy and powerful men who controlled the city's politics and economy. However, this ruling class was often challenged by popular uprisings and democratic movements, as well as by external threats from other city-states and empires. Not much is known about Sappho's life, and many of the details that have been passed down through history are the subject of debate among scholars. According to some sources, she was born into an aristocratic family and was married to a wealthy man. She is said to have had a daughter. There is very little information about Sappho's husband and daughter, and what little is known comes from fragments of Sappho's poetry and later ancient sources. According to one fragment of Sappho's poetry, her husband's name was Thrasyllus. Beyond this, nothing else is known about him, and it is unclear whether their marriage was arranged or whether they married for love. Sappho's daughter, Cleese, is mentioned in a few of Sappho's poems. In one fragment, Sappho addresses Cleese directly, telling her that she loves her and hopes that she will become a happy bride. Some scholars have suggested that Cleese may have been the inspiration for many of Sappho's love poems, although this is speculative. There is very little information about what happened to Sappho's husband and daughter after her death. Some sources suggest that Cleese may have become a poet herself and continued her mother's legacy. In Sappho's biography, as in her work, gaps predominate. A few facts can be inferred by triangulating various sources. The poems themselves, ancient reference works, citations in later classical writers who had access to information that has since been lost. Alcides was a contemporary of Sappho, and also a poet from the island of Lesbos. He is known to have written about Sappho in several of his poems, although many of these works have been lost over time. In one surviving fragment, Alcaeus refers to Sappho as the violet-haired or purple-robed Sappho, which may be a reference to her aristocratic background and the expensive clothing she would have worn as a wealthy woman. In another fragment, Alcaeus describes Sappho as the tenth muse, a term that suggests her importance and influence as a poet. He also praises her beauty and her skill as a musician and composer of songs. Mytilene was constantly seething with political and social dramas, occasioned by rivalries and shifting alliances among aristocratic clans. Sappho belonged to one of these. There's a fragment in which she chastises a friend of bad character, presiding with a rival clan, and a famous literary contemporary, a poet called Alcaeus, belonged to another. Alcaeus often refers to the island's political turbulence in his poems, and it's possible that at some point Sappho and her family fled or were exiled to southern Italy, Cicero refers in one of his speeches to a statue of the poet that had been erected in the town hall of Syracuse in Sicily. The greatest problem for Sappho studies is that there's so little Sappho to study. It would be hard to think of another poet whose status is so disproportionate to the size of her surviving body of work. We don't even know how much of her poetry Sappho actually wrote down. The ancients referred to her works as Mel of Songs, composed to be sung to the accompaniment of a lyre. This is what lyric poetry meant for the Greeks. They may well have been passed down from memory by her admirers and other poets before being committed at last to paper. Like other great poets of the time, she would have been a musician and a performer as well as a lyricist. She was credited with having invented a certain kind of lyre in the plectrum. Four centuries after her death, scholars at the Library of Alexandria cataloged nine books, papyrus scrolls of Sappho's poems organized primarily by Mater. Book one, for instance, gathered all the poems that had been composed in the sapphic stanza, the verse form Abing recognized in the brother's poem. This book alone reportedly contained 1,320 lines of verse. The contents of all nine volumes may have amounted to some 10,000 lines. So much of Sappho was circulating in antiquity that one Greek author, writing three centuries after her death, 
confidently predicted that the white columns of Sappho's lovely song endure and will endure speaking out loud, as long as ships sail from the Nile. By the Middle Ages, nearly everything had disappeared. As with much of classical literature, text of her work existed in relatively few copies, all painstakingly transcribed by hand. Over time, fire, flood, neglect, and bookworms, to say nothing of the disapproving church fathers, took their devastating toll. Market forces were also at work. As the centuries passed, fewer readers and fewer scribes understood Aeolic, the dialect in which Sappho composed, and so demand for new copies diminished. A 12th century Byzantine scholar who had hoped to write about Sappho crumbled that both Sappho and her works, the lyrics and the songs, have been trashed by time. Until a hundred years ago or so, when papyrus fragments of her poems started turning up, all that remained of those white columns of Sappho's song was a handful of lines quoted in the works of later Greek and Roman authors. At present, scholars have cataloged around 250 fragments, of which fewer than 70 contain complete lines. A great many consist of just a few words, some of a single word. Some things seem relatively certain then, but when it comes to Sappho's personal life, the aspect of her biography that scholars and readers are most eager to know about, the ancient record is confused. What did Sappho look like? A dialogue by Plato, written in the 4th century BC, refers to her as beautiful. A later author insisted that she was very ugly, being short and swarthy. Who were her family, the pseudo? which gives eight possible names for Sappho's father, asserts that she had a daughter and a mother, both named Cles, a gaggle of brothers, and a wealthy husband named Kirkalis from the island of Andros. But some of these seemingly precious facts merely show that the encyclopedia, which as old as it is, was compiled 15 centuries after Sappho lived, could be prone to comic misunderstandings. Many other alleged facts of Sappho's biography similarly dissolve on close scrutiny. Was Sappho really a mother? There is indeed a fragment that mentions a girl named Cleese, whose form resembles golden blossoms, but the word that some people have translated as daughter can also mean child or even slave. Who were the members of her circle? The Suda refers by name to three female students and three female companions, Athos, Telesippa, and Megara, with whom she had disgraceful friendships. But much of this is no more than can be reasonably extrapolated from the poems. The extant fragments mention nearly all those names. The compilers of the pseudo, like scholars today, may have been making educated guesses. Even Sappho's sexuality, which for modern readers is the most famous thing about her, has been controversial from the start. However, exalted her reputation among the ancient literati. In Greek popular culture of the classical period and afterwards Sappho was known primarily as an oversexed predator of men. This, in fact, was the ancient cliché about lesbians. When we hear the word today, we think of love between women. But when the ancient Greeks heard the word, they thought of something else. For centuries, the most popular story about her love life was one about a hopeless passion for a handsome young boatman called Phan, which allegedly led her to jump off a cliff. That tale has been embroidered, dramatized, and novelized over the centuries by writers from Ovid, who in one poem has Sappho abjectly renouncing her gay past to Erica Chong, in her 2003 novel, Sappho's Leap. As fanciful as it is, it's easy to see how this melodrama of heterosexual passion could have been inspired by her verse, which so often describes the anguish of unrequited love. The added element of suicide suggests that those who wove this improbable story wanted us to take away a moral. Unfettered expressions of great passion will have dire consequences. As time went on, the fantasies about Sappho's private life became more extreme. Midway through the first century ad, the Roman philosopher Seneca, tutor to Nero, was complaining about a Greek scholar who had devoted an entire treatise to the question of whether Sappho was a prostitute. The eagerness to come up with innocent explanations for the poet's attachment to young women persisted through the late 19th century and into the 20th. The most tenacious theory held that Sappho was the head of a girls' boarding school, a matron whose interest in her pupils was purely pedagogical. Another theory made her into an august priestess, leading an association of young women who devoted themselves to the cult of the goddess. Classicists today have no problem with the idea of a gay Sappho, but some have been challenging the interpretation of her work that seems most natural to 21st century readers, that the poems are deeply personal expressions of private homoerotic passion. Pointing to the relentlessly public and communitarian character of ancient Greek society, 
with its clan allegiances, its endless rounds of athletic games and artistic competitions, its jammed calendar of civic and religious festivals. They wonder whether personal poetry, as we understand the term, even existed for someone like Sappho. Between the paucity of actual poems and the woeful unreliability of the biographical tradition, these debates are unlikely to be resolved anytime soon. Indeed, the study of Sappho is beset by a curious circularity. For the better part of a millennium, between the compilation of the Suda and the late 19th century, the same bits of poetry and the same biographical gossip were endlessly recycled. The poetic fragments, providing the sources for biographies that were then used as the basis for new interpretations of those same fragments.